Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is going to be a little bit of a story timey, discussion-y type video. Very sort of off the cuff, but still something I'm going to try and keep constructed in terms of uh, the way that it's presented, at least. But this video is something that I've been wanting to make for a little while. Uh, it's something that covers at least a part of a blanketed topic of like what made me the player that I am today, in terms of the way I approach gameplay, the way I approach the game, and etc. Uh, but basically... It is about why Dragon Ravine being banned made me better as a player at Yu-Gi-Oh! and really accelerated my growth as a player and really broke me out of a shell that I had sort of locked myself into. So this is sort of a cautionary tale of like just not making the same mistakes that I've made as a player uh, when I was, you know, in the early stages of playing this game that we love. But it's something that I wanted to talk about because regardless of how often your videos get viewed, as long as you are a content creator that has any sort of reach to a significant number of people, despite how small Yugi Tubing is, it's still something that, like, you reach at least a decent sized audience in terms of the scope of, like, the Yu Gi Oh community. And so, if you're ever one of those people that gets asked about how you, like, evaluate cards or, like, why you make certain plays that you make or why you play certain decks that you make, it really starts making you overly aware and internalize like your thought processes of like what made you this way and you try to put that out there to people that ask you those questions because they're trying to learn and trying to improve as well but so basically this i guess for a lack of a better term you could say this is sort of one of the origin stories for what has made phoenix flare x into phoenix flare x because i definitely was not a good player uh, or what I would consider a good player. I still think that I'm, I think I'm a decent player right now. I'm still nowhere near the level of good player, in air quotes, that I want to be. I, I, I strive for a constant improvement flow. Um, every day that I play this game, I try to make myself better than I was the day before. But that's besides the point. That's a different topic altogether. But so, why Dragon Ravine being banned made me a better player overall uh, is a topic that is very interesting considering the Dragoonity is, is my favorite deck that I've ever played it is my favorite archetype uh, and it's one of those things that like if I could have been allowed to play Dragoonity until the end of time I probably would have if it had gone uninterrupted now what do I mean by this Dragon Ravine got banned January 2014 and remained banned between January 2014 and April 2015, in which case it came back to one copy per deck, then in July it went back to two copies per deck, and then only fairly recently, like within the last nine to ten months, did it go back to a full three copies per deck. Konami really took their sweet time on that one. But basically, for the entirety of Dragon Ravine's legality, and for a short amount of time before that, I had played almost exclusively Dragoonities, period. Like, I was testing the deck with proxies of Dragon Ravine in it at locals during, like, you know, in between tournament rounds. I wouldn't enter locals at tournament, uh, locals tournaments um, some weeks because I just didn't want to play anything that wasn't Dragoonities. And so, like, from the entire point of Dragon Ravine being released legally, at every tournament that I had to pay to enter, with maybe one or two or three exceptions, I played Dragoonities almost exclusively from then until January 2014 when the card got banned as an attempt to kill the Dragon Ruler deck off. So what this does as a player is, is that it makes you very, very influenced by that deck only, and it limits your exposure to being able to make proper thought processes and decision trees when it comes to being exposed to literally anything else. Especially when the deck evolves as a combo deck as Dragoonities did, it got better and better as it went on because it started out just being a really, really basic deck of normal summon ducks and that means that's a level 8 synchro with very minor technical play errors depending on what techs you were playing. And then in 2012 it evolved into the Atum deck to summon Darkness Metal from deck and do some stuff like that and those sorts of shenanigans until eventually it reached the best point that it was ever at in 2013 when the Dragon Rulers were legal with Tempest in its own dedicated Dragoonity Tempest deck, or in the grand scheme of the big Dragoonity Ruler deck that was basically one of the top decks at that time. So you'd think that this you know, builds you up as a player to be playing you know a rogue deck for a long time, 
and then suddenly the deck is actually tier one after two years of you playing it, and that gives you a huge advantage over the field, which that is correct. I did have a very big advantage in a lot of the mirror matches that I played during Dragoonity Ruler format because I was playing cards that other people were not as one of techs that were easily accessible because I knew how the deck functioned without Dragon Rulers, and I wanted that high ceiling to be in my Dragon Ruler deck as well, so things like that did give me an advantage. I was doing very well at regional circuits during that time frame. Unfortunately, I was too poor to travel to any of the three YCSs during that time period, which were all on the West Coast. But basically, I got locked into this deck that I really enjoyed and really liked playing, and there's nothing wrong with playing a deck you enjoy, but I literally only played Dragoonities for three years. <laughs> From March 2011 until January 2014, for three years, solid, unbroken virtually, I played some form of Dragoonity deck, and I would try to pick up other decks that were combo decks like Windups or Mermails or other decks like that, and I just could not play them correctly for the life of me. I could memorize the one like basic Magician Shark combo that ended in like Shock Lock and stuff like that, or I could memorize the Hand Loop combo, or I could memorize all the like the the main basic Insector OTK combo, or I could basically like memorize like one of the main Mermail combos. But other than that, I could not pilot the decks intricately enough to ever take them to tournaments because I would cookie cutter myself into that one combo sequence and I'd be like, well, this is getting too difficult, so I'm just going to play Dragoonities instead. And that was a huge problem that actually a lot of my friends tried to save me from, but ultimately nothing really came about from that. Uh, like, they would try to tell me not to play Dragoonities and to commit to another deck, but at that point I would just be like, nah, I know how to play this deck, so I'll play it at a regional. And the thing is, is I would get successes every once in a while that were like top 8 finishes or regional wins or whatever, and that would only fuel me to play the deck. Um, so, like, those successes had a fair deal of luck involved, but they were still things that, I mean, they, they, you can't really get that level of success that you're wanting to have if you're trying to be a competitive player with a rogue deck, especially one that's a little bit on the fragile side, like Dragoonities was, and still is. So, where does this come into play with, you know, Ravine being banned? With Ravine in the Dragon Ruler deck... I was very actively stating that if Dragon Ravine went to 1 on the next list, that I was still going to play Dragoonities, and I was just going to play Pseudo Space. I had several game plans lined up. I was like, all the Dragon Rulers are going to get banned. I don't know if I can play this deck as a, like as like efficiently without Dragon Rulers, so I'm just going to play a lot of recovery cards like Call of the Haunted and stuff, so that if my Darkness Metals get dealt with and I can bring them back, I can use Call of the Haunted as like a combo piece. Um, if my plays start a bit slower, all that sort of stuff. I already had a lot of different things and ideas lined up for how I was going to continue to play Dragoonities for upwards of another year of trying to just make the deck playable at events. But that all went away with Dragon Ravine being banned. With Dragon Ravine being banned, I finally had to sit down and be forced to play other decks, and it allowed me to really blossom out as a player. So basically what I'm saying is do not limit yourself to one deck. You may have that deck that you really enjoy and that you like playing a lot, but basically if you only play exclusively that deck and then you are also trying to improve and compete on a competitive level, you are not going to succeed. You are not going to be that guy that plays one deck for the entirety of your existence that ever like that you ever are going to play. You're not going to be that guy. You are not going to be that guy. <laughs> it's just not feasible. The reason these decks aren't, you know, good in tournament winning is because they lack some fundamental strengths that the decks that are winning tournaments do. So it's only gotten harder for you to be uh, someone who plays a deck like that. But so I was planning on continuing to play Dragoonities with no, like, care in the world if Dragon Ravine had stayed legal at even one copy per deck after Dragon Ruler format in 2013. Ravine got banned. And then, even then, I still tried to play Dragoonities with, like, Blue Eyes draw engines and maximizing on certain combo cards and stuff, and the deck just could not work consistently. 
The problem I had with trying to transition over into other decks is that Dragoonities, in terms of a deck that I had picked to be my, you know, sole project that I literally was only going to play exclusively, is that it spoils you as a player because all of your plays start with ducks. All of your big plays start with ducks and an extender. How accessible is ducks? You literally have six copies of Dragon Ravine in your deck and three copies of ducks. You have so many ways to access your one starter card that statistically you had such a high chance of playing out every turn one that you could play. This was not even factoring in other draw cards that your deck could be playing like Cards of Consonants, Triple Upstarts, Consistency cards. Even without those, you had like a solid 73% chance of seeing Dragon Ravine turn one or something like that. And we still drew to six cards as well. So like you had that, then you had other combinations of opening plays. Like it was just really easy for you to tunnel vision into, I just need this one starter card. And then my plays will form themselves from that. But then when you transition away from that, almost no other Yu-Gi-Oh deck functions like this with minor exceptions being recently with things like Union Hanger and Magical Meltdown in uh, Invoked and stuff like that. Like, very, very recently has this, this sort of playstyle of having a very, very simple one-card concrete starter that you have a lot of access to, into into your deck been such a, you know, a commodity. So, in 2014, I had to immediately try and transition as a player, as somebody who could barely, like grasp the concepts of how to structure intricate plays around and modify combos on the fly and immediately got thrust into this world of there are all these other decks that I have to play and I can't just normal summon one card and let that one card be what starts my play. So very quickly over the course of 2014, 2014 was the year that I improved the most as a player. Guaranteed. And my improvement was so rapid in terms of how long it took. By Nationals, I was at a point where I could look at my past plays as my, you know, at, I could look at my past self in terms of the plays that I was making and the ways that I would build decks and stuff like that and just completely tear to shreds what I thought was good at the time. Like, I could completely look back on myself and think, wow, I actually just sucked. Because, like, in the early stages of 2014, I jumped around... The first deck I tried to pick up was uh, Hieratic uh, Rulers, which was at least an easy conversion. I think that was probably the best deck for me to start trying to play uh, competitively because it hit all the same sort of angles. You summon dragons, make its hum. It had the same sort of, you know, play cycling as Dragoonies did as well in terms of you just use different cards to facilitate different plays, but at the end of the day, you were still functioning around Dragon Rulers and you were still functioning around Atum yielding you advantage off of the Hieratic Monsters, which is the same sort of deal that Atum had with Dragoonities. You just, you know, you gained advantage off of both of them working in tandem. But then after that, I had to transition away from that deck in a very rapid state as well. Like, I played that deck non-stop for, like, three weeks straight, like, playing, like, six to seven hours of Yu-Gi-Oh! per day, like, testing that deck, until I finally got to a point where... I realized that I wasn't really going to do well with the deck because it just wasn't good enough in the current, you know, state of the game. I still owned a Mermel deck at this point uh, from, like, uh, late 2013 when I got it for cheap because it was Dragon Ruler format and Mermels weren't the best deck. They were a good deck, but they weren't the best deck. And so, basically, I was able to ease myself into that deck, and that deck is also just another very, very good combo deck. And at the time, it was one of, if not the best deck at the very beginning of 2014 when it was back to Mermel and Firefist format with some outliers here and there. Firefist was the most represented deck, but Mermel's tended to beat it nine times out of ten. Um, and then there were the outliers like Hieratic Dragon Rulers and stuff that were still uh, kicking around and stuff like that. So it was basically just I got thrust into the fire of improve as a player because you need to start thinking about how plays get structured outside of having them handed to you on a silver platter and then you have to and then you have to just decide where you end um, you you have actual problems in deck building that you have to solve because you can't just discard whatever card is dead with dragon ravine like things like that things like that were things that started having to be pounded into my head really quickly and by the time nationals rolled around literally six seven months later I was 
infinitely better at the game than I was in terms of how I built myself up as a player over the past three years. In fact, from the time that I started playing Dragoonities to the time that Dragon Dragoon got banned, I actually believe that I regressed as a player because I used to be able to pick up decks and like that's how I picked up Dragoonities. I picked up Dragoonities very quickly. It was like it was one of those decks that I just I saw it. I liked the plays that it did in terms of like the ways you could structure some complex plays around Levitin and stuff like that and what you could do with simple card interactions and stuff. But then I just sort of clinged to it and gravitated to it for so long that it sort of just ruined my player sense in terms of how I could play other decks that didn't have this option to them. And that was just really, really bad. Like, I came towards Dragoonities from playing decks like Black Wings and, uh, and Disaster Dragon and stuff like that that were in, like, Glad Beasts, decks that were very, you know, resource-based and had to hit certain things at certain points. You didn't have, you know, universal starter cards and stuff like that. And then I transitioned into Dragoonities because it was like, yeah, this is a new combo deck that's coming out, and it looks like it could be really good and have a lot of room to grow, which it did. It was very good for a long time in terms of a rogue status deck, um, which is something that you don't get a lot of. That's a very rare occurrence uh, for a rogue deck to actually be decent enough on a power output ceiling to actually compete with the decks of the format. I got really lucky with Dragoonities to even be able to do well at like regional level events with that deck and having multiple YCS bubbles with it. Like I got if I could say anything, I got damn good with Dragoonities in terms of how I could play that deck. But the problem is is that that deck functioned on such a different basis from literally the rest of Yu-Gi-Oh at the time that once it was stripped away from me or whenever I would try to branch out into something different, there was a very clear disconnect in terms of how I'd been playing Yu-Gi-Oh! for literally one, two, and three years at, at like the point that Ravine got banned. So, basically, if Ravine had never gotten banned, I would probably still be playing Dragoonities today. But, I don't play Dragoonities today. Do I love the deck? Yes. Do I have a deck version of it built at pretty much all times? Practically, yes. Am I constantly solitary in combos with Dragoonities right now? Yes. Every once in a while when I get bored, I'll solitaire some Dragoonity combos, whether it's current format or past format, try to find combos, all that sort of stuff. But I do not play the deck at any events, period. Because I understand the disconnect that deck has in terms of what is required to be a good tournament winning deck. And if Ravine had never been banned, I don't believe that I would ever have made that correlation. I would have continued playing Dragoonities literally all the way through every single format making adjustments to the deck as the game evolved but i would not be doing nearly as well as i am as a player because i would be looking at every single thing that i look at in terms of analyzing a card analyzing gameplay constructing combo sequences i'd be looking at every single one of those through the lenses of a dragoonity player that just wants to normal summon ducks and have that be the start the universal start to every single play that he makes. And so, this actually comes into play in another video I plan on doing, specifically targeted at World Chalice and my involvement with him for the last six to eight months. Well, more than that, Jesus, it's been since August. That's like almost ten months at this point. Uh, <laughs> but so, um, that's a different video for a different day. But basically, if Ravine had never gotten banned, we would never be having this conversation. I would have given up on my YouTube channel because... I mean, Ravine getting put back to two did bring me back to YouTube, but I very quickly started branching out into the different decks that I was capable of playing because I was used to playing decks like Shadals and Necros and stuff like that at that point. Decks that actually let me get a taste again of what quantifies a good deck as being a good deck. And then I didn't cling to Dragoonities like I would have done several times in the past. If you went back in time and took 2012 me or 2013 me and took me right here right now and said you could play the best deck in the format or you could play Dragoonities, that past me would always pick Dragoonities because it's just the way that I had hardwired my mind into only being able to play that deck. And that's a pitfall that you can fall into as a player. If you only play the same deck over and over again for long expanses of time and do not let yourself be persuaded to play other options, then you're just going to completely inhibit your growth as a player 
and you could actually have a chance of regressing into a worse player, which is definitely what I could say that I did. But then once you break out of that shell and try playing decks that are actually, you know, at least, you don't even have to go for the best deck of the format. Just go for something that's at least, you know, got results behind it that's competitively viable. Don't strive to create the result yourself unless you genuinely think that the deck is broken, but don't just mindlessly play the deck expecting to get results. If you see a deck that has results that are fairly recent, then see if you can mess around with it, but you're going to improve as a player a ton if you play a deck that actually has a certain, you know, power level floor, If with, without lack of a better term, like a viability rating, I guess, would be the best way to put it, that at least gives you a chance to go ahead and get a top at a regional or win your locals or something. At least play a deck that has the proven ability to do that at whatever given time you're doing, and then allow that to, you know, because the, then at that point, like, the failure is not on your deck, the failure is on you as a player, if you're not playing the deck up to snuff, and you will improve to a certain point. But if you're playing a deck for an extended period of time, like I did, and you have a deck that's only consistently getting worse and worse, and was already not that great to start off with, and you're not doing well at your locals, you're not doing well at regionals or whatever, you're always getting stomped by your friends when you play... There's a point where, like, if your deck is worse than what they're playing, then you're not going to have as much room to grow, is what I'm trying, I guess is what this entire video boils down to, is that if you limit yourself in terms of the deck choice you make, and only play the same deck for infinite amounts of time, you are not going to improve as a player in terms of the way that you're able to look at other decks and see what their plays are and construct their plays yourself, and then you're also going to be sort of driving yourself into a corner as your deck continues to get worse and worse, you as a player are going to learn the most from failure. Failures that you make, plays that you make that are wrong, plays that you make that could have been better, but if your deck doesn't have the ability to actually compete against what you're playing against on a sort of, you know, decent level to even allow you the chance to make these mistakes that are the deciding factors in your games, then you're just not going to improve as a player. But so, this is a completely long-winded video, and if anyone even made it this far, I would be incredibly surprised. Give me a hashtag, dr <laughs> give me a hashtag Dragon Ravine in the comments down below if you made it this far into the video, and let me know what your thoughts are on these sorts of uh, videos in the comments down below as always. But other than that, as always, guys, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. Again, this is basically just, I don't know, like we constructed as it could be, you know, construed as rambling or whatever, but. It's sort of kind of the only way I can do this video. <laughs> but, yeah, Dragon Ravine being banned made me have to become a better player because I couldn't just play the same deck that I'd been playing for infinite amounts of time anymore that I was perfectly content with trying to continue to play, but I just couldn't play it anymore because it actually was just unplayable. And then, thusly, I had to reteach myself the game, essentially, in terms of how other decks function that don't just have an all-in-one field spell or all-in-one card in general that just starts every single individual play for you uh, that makes it very easy for you to construct, you know, thought processes. So, uh, it's just one of those things. But anyway, like I said, thanks for watching. Thanks for your time as usual, guys. And take care. I'll see you in the next video.